So we've got some new super smart tactics um, that we can report on from the president in the final days of this campaign. Okay, so 60 Minutes um, with Leslie Stahl. They were recording an interview with him and Mike Pence and also with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris all to air on this Sunday. And apparently, we can throw this up on the screen, um, Trump threw a hissy fit during the interview, abruptly cut it off, refused to film a like walk and talk thing with Mike Pence. Then he took to Twitter, and we can throw up his tweets on the screen, to taunt Leslie Stahl, saying, I am pleased to inform you that for the sake of accuracy and reporting, I'm considering posting my interview with Leslie Stahl prior to airtime. This will be done so that everybody can get a glimpse of what a fake and biased interview is all about. Everyone should compare this terrible electoral intrusion with the recent interviews of sleepy Joe Biden. As of this recording, he has yet to post the interview. Um, he also posted this video showing Leslie Stahl without a mask on. Now, I guess he's the mask police. Uh, according to Stahl people, this was immediately after the interview. She had yet to put her mask back on. He shared this as well. Um, the reporting is, Sagar, that what she asked him about was just like pretty standard issue stuff. Coronavirus, mm -hmm. um, his feud with Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Apparently there was a question about the size of his crowd, something to that effect. Again, standard, standard cable news fair, a lot of discussion there about the crowds and yeah. how close together and all that. So... That caused him to freak out and storm out of the interview. Yeah, it's really, I mean, I look, I, I'm not above, you know, having somebody storm out of an interview. I just think the whole thing is a little bizarre. And I think it actually goes to show Trump is very on edge right now. Basically, everything that we've seen in terms of reporting from inside the campaign, talking about how he's been dealing with his advisors whenever they're telling him that they might have to cut funding in X place or Y place, like somebody in the industrial Midwest, that he is really on a razor's edge. And you could see a little bit of this, actually, whenever he was talking on that campaign public call that we covered yesterday, where he went after Fauci and he was telling his campaign, like, two weeks ago, I would have said that we wouldn't have won, but now I think we will. We can still win, all of that. He's angry. I think you can largely see that he's frustrated with the current situation. Obviously, the st stimulus negotiations are largely going nowhere, although who knows? I mean, the state of the campaign, coronavirus, it's like you just can't wish it away, man. You know, it just it, it's just not something that is like that with so many of the other political crises that he's faced in his life. And it manifests itself in behavior like this. I was actually thinking, you know, this wasn't a bad opportunity because – all, all these older voters watch 60 Minutes. It's like, a, look, I don't watch 60 Minutes. Sometimes whenever it goes viral, like whatever. But a lot of these boomer voters who he needs to win, they watch the hell out of 60 Minutes. I mean, they, they routinely get like 20, 30 million viewers on these programs. That's almost second to like a presidential debate. And so I'm not saying it isn't going to air and all that. And I'm sure that, you know, the questions were annoying, just like standard cable news stuff. But these are big opportunities in certain ways. Whenever you're this short out from the election, you need to win over older voters. I actually think that's where it hardest hits for him. That's actually a great, a great point that this is one of the few last opportunities he had to project a different image. Instead, he just feeds into like the worst caricature, exactly why people are so sick of him and want someone who's going to be a little more even, even if it is like sleepy and boring and sort of like a pathetically uninspiring message coming from the Joe Biden campaign. I also think, again, it's this um, dynamic of he's stuck in this bubble of his hardest core base. Because I'm sure his people love this, right? They love him storming yeah, out. They love putting up the mass video, calling her out, the tweets. He talked about his rally last night. All of those things play super well to the, like, 20% of the country, who, or maybe even 30% of the country, who just absolutely are there for all of this. But that's kind of the problem writ large for him in this election is there was a time in 2016 when putting himself on the side of his base, it actually worked because it super energized them. The issues he picked were like 40, 60 issues rather than like 80, 20 issues. Now he's on the wrong side of these 80, 20 issues and storming out of this interview at a time when people really, really want to see a leader project like calm and normalcy is exactly the wrong direction to go in. Look, I mean, I don't want to make like 
an unbelievable amount out of it. This will be a couple day story. We'll see how the interview right, goes on yeah. Sunday when it comes out. He's now called way more attention to Leslie Stahl in 60 Minutes than this probably ever would have gotten, even though this is a really widely watched news program. I think it's the number one news program in the country oh, yeah. just in terms of sheer number of viewers. So um, he blows an opportunity. He plays into the worst caricature of himself and is sort of emblematic of the way that his campaign has gone all together. I think, no, I think that's right. And it just, it demonstrates, he keeps, he's like mainlining some of the basically GOP base stuff that lands with them. And he has got to understand, any politician has to understand this, which is, look, at the end of the day, like, he won with a larger coalition. A lot of people, like I've said this so many times, a lot of people did not like Trump at all. He had very high uh, unfavorability ratings in 2016, but they voted for him anyways because they thought that he was going to deliver on policy promises that mattered to them. A lot of people don't like Joe Biden or they think he's not even up to the task, and a lot of people are going to vote for them too. That's what it's really all about. You have to make it relevant to you in your life. So conduct like this is fine if you're offering up some of that other stuff, but when you don't have that other stuff, these are the few things that you can actually do in order to try and reassure, calm, and get some voters. And in ge- look, I'm, like you said, this isn't going to swing anything. We'll probably forget about it within two days. But it's just an emblem of something that's happening 13 days out from an election. Yeah, and look, I think the bottom line is Joe Biden didn't really have what it takes on his own to defeat Trump. Trump has defeated himself in that's moments right. like this over months and months and months from especially the beginning of the coronavirus, where he just projects exactly the opposite of what the American people actually want to see in this moment. And look, I want to say, I don't think that the media is fair to him whatsoever. I think he's right Mm -hmm. that they treat Joe Biden with kids, kid gloves. Personally, I mean, let's put Russiagate aside and the like insanity and conspiracy theorizing, which is unacceptable all the way around. I would like to see more of the aggressive approach taken towards Donald Trump towards all politicians and not treat Joe Biden or Stacey Abrams or Kamala Harris like they're your celebrity friend or your like, you know, your daughter and grandpa that you have to be super nice and careful with. Um, I would like to see more of actually that Trump aggressive style journalism that's directed towards him, towards all of them. So he's not wrong that it's not even handed. But if you think back to 2016, I mean, from the jump, the media hated him, even though they loved him and they got lots of ratings down and made a lot of people famous. And there was like the symbiotic relationship. He always played them like a fiddle. You know, you wouldn't see him like getting ruffled like this. It, you wouldn't see him having a sort of emotional outburst. He was in control. Even if it was a, uh, the move that he made was over the top or ridiculous or theatrical, et cetera, it was always him in control. And so I think it goes back to what you were saying about you can really see the panic and the desperation setting in mm-hmm. and the frustration setting in in these past couple of weeks where for the first time maybe in his life, there, the situation is out of his control and all of his normal tricks and antics are just not getting the job done whatsoever. I think that's right. All right, we're going to have more rising for you after this.